Hey everyone, how y'all doing? Uh, welcome to the first episode of Four Hours of Sleep with Polly Escobedo. That's me. Um, you might be asking yourself, like, why do a podcast? Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that, really. But, I don't know. I just had the setup. You know, I used to stream games on Twitch. And, uh, just figured it'd be something fun to do, you know? I, uh, originally wanted to do this before, like, but... I didn't really know where to start. I guess I felt like it'd probably be better if I, like, had an established comedian friend. I can kind of, like, be there, Jamie, you know, do the background stuff for. But after a bit, I figured, you know, this might be something I should do myself, you know? Like, I can't be, um, really hiding behind people or just expecting them to do all be the face. Like, that's why I'm doing stand-up. Like, I gotta be comfortable putting myself out there in every aspect, you know? And I'm doing a two-camera system, you know, do back-and-forth takes kind of flawlessly and also unflawlessly, just so that way, like, in case um, something goes wrong, you know, I can kind of cut to and edit a little bit easier, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, if I accidentally drop, like, a racial slur or something, but I don't think I'll fuck up that bad. I'm not, like, a stupid. So, um, next quite <laughs> But, no, like, uh... Really just want to, like, talk about, like, you know, like, starting a podcast. Not really starting a podcast, but, like, starting my comedy journey. Like, what got me here? Um, takes us back, like, 1996, you know? <laughs> I was five. Okay, maybe a little bit after. I don't know. Whatever year, I was in, like, third grade. Um, I actually did stand-up for, like, the school talent show, you know? And I told the worst jokes imaginable, let me tell you. But... It was still a lot of fun. Like, um, I went up there, all my third grade friends laughed, none of the older kids or teachers did, but it was still a good time. And, um, growing up, like, I never really fit in a whole lot, you know? Like, I wasn't really into sports, I was kind of quiet, uh, loved jokes, though, loved making people laugh. And that was, like, the one way I really got attention, is mostly just, like, Going up when uh, we had to be up in front of the class and putting on little performances. Um, I think like fifth grade, we used to have the teacher would tell us like one kid tell like a joke of the day and it was always me. You know, everybody would always turn to me for it. But really, it was like doing the class presentations is what really got me. Because like I'd be up there and um, like all the kids were like excited to hear what I had to say, you know, watch me perform. And it was really different, you know? Like, before, like, none of these kids really paid attention to me. And now, like, I had their full attention. Like, all the, even, like, all the hot popular girls were just staring at me, waiting, like... And, I don't know, I loved it, you know? I even did little, like, dances at parties and stuff. Uh, just any way to really entertain. And, um... I don't know, I never followed through with it later on. Like, I, I did, like, the improv club in high school. But it wasn't really a whole lot. Like, I didn't take it seriously. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, recently that, about a year ago almost, that I really started taking stand-up super seriously. But I always wanted to do it. Like, I love listening to Joey Diaz. And uh, on his podcast, he always talked about, like, starting stand-up. What to do. How to do it. You know, always consistently writing jokes down. Stuff like that, you know? So that's what I did. Like... I'm 32 now. I was writing jokes down back when I was 20, you know, and just thinking, uh, one day I'll do this shit. I'll give it a shot. But it seemed pretty unlikely. Like, I always had it in the back of my mind and never went through with it, you know. At the time, um, I was going pretty steady with my girl. We were about eight years, eight, nine years in, you know. Uh, found out, you know, I was going to be a dad. That was huge, uh, wasn't wasn't expecting that you know but um i thought i needed to you know do the right thing so i started working two jobs you know i worked six to like 145 or six to 345 at starbucks and then two to ten or four to ten at trader joe's and i did that like five days a week for uh about like six eight months something like that up until the pandemic hit, you know, and fucking Starbucks shut down, which was pretty dope.
like it needed to shut down but yeah um did that and son was born taking care of him during the pandemic you know end up quitting starbucks just working at trader joe's and i knew i couldn't like basically provide for a family you know just working at a fucking grocery store so i started uh taking school more seriously um one thing i did for 10 years was uh, i fought mma or you know competed trained mma i did a lot of like local tournaments and kickboxing and jujitsu and placed in a few of them you know so uh really it was just like you know the exercise was my real passion the conditioning the training things like that competing so I was for a few years a personal trainer, like I got my certification for that. And I figured the next step would be a physical therapist. And then I looked at how much schooling was and I was like, fuck that, you know, what's somewhere in between. And that's when I decided to be a physical therapist assistant, you know, it was basically like an AA, like, uh, and like a pretty good medical job too, you know? So I was going to school for that. And at the time, uh, my son's mom and I, we had to split, you know, um, we had some, some ongoing differences that we couldn't, couldn't really resolve, you know, uh, we just, uh, unfortunately really grew apart, you know, me working two jobs while she was, you know, expecting that took a huge toll out on us. It was, we, you know, we had a lot and, um, we split while I was in school and uh, I thought, you know, there's still a chance of us getting back together. Uh, there wasn't. <laughs> and while I thought we were working things out, um, you know, she was seeing somebody else. And I'm not trying to demonize or anything like that. Like, I definitely wasn't perfect in that relationship whatsoever, you know. Like, yeah, I mean, I wasn't like fucking shitty but you know like it's just like any relationship it always needs work and stuff like that but at the time you know um i didn't really realize what i needed to put in and what i should be doing different and i don't know it's just stuff from my end you know but uh when i found out that she was seeing somebody else you know and she hadn't seen him for a while it really uh really kind of destroyed my world <laughs> And I didn't really know what to do at that point, you know, like I was in school, I was doing this, you know, basically start a family, take care of both of them. And uh, I was no longer an option. Like I no longer had any self identity, you know. And one of my better friends, uh, she was working at Trader Joe's at the time, we had like a minor falling out, you know. Um, she, uh, she actually, like, uh, quit Trader Joe's, you know, start a vegan taco truck, you know, shout out to Vegan Vendetta, you know, Michelle and her husband running that right now over here in, uh, Morgan Hill, California, but, um, you know, she went to go pursue her own passion, and something in me was just mad that she was, you know, like, I was just, like, being a fucking hater, I, I, I didn't understand why at first, you know, sometimes you get those, like, irrational, like, madness or anger at somebody, you know, when they're doing good. Because, really, you're not, you know? She went to go follow a dream and a passion, and I was still stocking shelves, and, uh, turned me bitter. But I recognized that, you know? And I eventually reached out to her, and I was honest. I was like, you know, I was bitter. I was angry about you pursuing something i wasn't that's what it came down to you know i apologize about that i want to show my support i want to be there for you you know i don't want to be that type of person you know and um i didn't really recognize it until i started like really paying attention like sometimes you have thoughts and you just run away with them you don't actually analyze like why am i having this you know but you know i came clean with her with that i told her what i was going through you know I was going through a pretty big uh, depressive episode at the time, you know. And um, I told her that I wanted to try stand up, right? Like, I wanted to do this. And she was incredibly encouraging. 
Whoa, my computer is fucking hot. All right. So she was incredibly encouraging, um, telling me to do it. And the first time I went to try, I saw there was an open mic here, like right down the street from me. And I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to do this, you know, like um, something had gone me mad, you know, like ignited this like passion in me that I was like, I need to go start this shit like right now, right now. You know, I'm going to go fucking do this. So like I went out, I drove to this place, you know, I'm walking in with this like amped up energy. Like, I'm going to fucking do this. It's going to be my first time, right? And I get in there, and I open the door, and the whole place is just, like, over 60 years old. I look at the audience, everyone's really much older than me. The people on stage were these, like, older hippies playing guitar, folk guitar, like, rocking out. This is what the open mic was. And I looked around for a little bit, like, oh, well, should I do this? I'm looking for someone kind of close in my age, and there was nobody, nobody at all. So I turned around and I walked back to my car and uh, I just laughed to myself about the situation, you know? Like, I got all amped up, all ready to fucking perform for the first time, and, uh, and that's what happened. <laughs> the next day uh, was Tuesday, and I actually had reached out to, um, when I was working at Starbucks, there was this uh, 16-year-old kid working there. He's a comic right now. His name's uh, Jason Cruz. Shout out to Jason Cruz. And, um, like, I was probably about 27. He was 16. And um, he's, you know, I'm over here asking him for advice on how to follow my dream, you know? <laughs> Basically, a kid in high school, like, how do I get started? What do I do? Like, what, what, what did you do? What should I do, you know? Um, I don't know, and I was just kind of being a hater on him too, like, motherfucker, fucking kid, you know, out there doing what I want at that young of an age, man, fuck him, like, I admit it, like, there's times where I'm a hater and I shouldn't be, that was one of them, <laughs> but, I messaged him, like, later on, uh, that's when I was still working at Starbucks, uh, prior to my son being born. I had originally tried to do comedy before he was born. I went to um, Cafe for Scotty in San Jose with him. I actually went twice and didn't perform once. I kind of just sat in the back and watched, you know, trying to get a vibe for uh, the crowd and what to do and everything like that. Like, I've been watching a ton of stand-up my entire life, you know? Like, uh, being a... Uh... What is this? Sorry, my computer keeps saying near record temperature. I don't know if they're talking about, I don't know if it's talking about the fucking weather outside or the computer itself. I don't know. I'm getting distracted. My ADD is hella fucking bad. ADHD, whatever. But, you know, um, I always was watching stand-up, uh, even when I was a kid. I'm jumping at way too many different points in time, but it's all adding, all adding together. Um... Yeah, like one time I had the flu when I was in seventh grade, and all I did all week was just watch premium blend stand up on Comedy Central the entire time. That's when I first saw like Kevin Hart, Gabriel Iglesias, Bill Burr, all these guys before they got like super huge. It was dope, you know. So I had a feel for like how to, how did you stand up or what it was supposed to be, you know. But actually going out and performing, controlling my nerves, that was something incredibly new to me, you know. Like I hadn't performed since I was like in school, so. I, lo I just watched at Cafe for Scotties, never went up, didn't do anything like that, I bitched out, you know. And then uh, this was prior to me working two jobs. So when I started working two jobs, I had my morning job and my night job, like stand-up was out of the question. So that Monday mic, when I wanted to do stand-up, didn't work out. The next day was Tuesday. I messaged Jason Cruz. I'd be like, hey, man, it's been a few years. Remember me from Starbucks? I try doing comedy, I really want to give it a shot now, you know, uh, what do you suggest, and he was dope, he was supportive as fuck, you know, he gave me a whole bunch of, uh, ideas and stuff, you know, he told me the best South Bay open mic was at the Blue Lagoon in Santa Cruz, shout out to the Blue, so, that's where I went, Tuesday, I planned it out, I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna go to the Blue Lagoon in Santa Cruz, you know, uh, I'm going to
to do this. Like, I'm, I'm so excited. And Tuesday came, and I had my friend Michelle texting me and checking in, like, you're going, right? You're going. You're going to do this. Like, that's how supportive of me she was, you know? She told me, checking in on me, making sure I was going to do this shit, because it'd be good for me. And I was really scared on my way there, but, you know, I was just full of adrenaline, listening to, uh... Bill Burr, that dream video you can find on YouTube. I was also listening to Lose, it, Lose Yourself by Eminem. You know, just trying to pump myself up any way possible. So, you know, I'm driving to Santa Cruz. I'm going the back way to, uh, from, like, the Peoria area. So you go through Watsonville, which is, like, you know, like, farmland, farm town, really. And I'm driving, and Michelle's checking on me, like, you're going, are you on your way there? I sent her a picture of the farmland in Santa Cruz or in Watsonville, you know, letting her know that I'm on my way there. Which, you know, shout out to her for being a true friend, making, you know, holding me accountable to that shit. So I get to the blue and um, I see the guy who's running it, uh, Jorge Sanchez. You know, I go and he's, you know, trying to reel people in, you know, try to get an audience. It's like, hey, you man, you want to come see some live comedy? And I was like, yeah, that's actually what I'm here for, man. Is it cool if I sign up? And go, oh, oh, yeah, sure, go for it. So I go and I find the sign-up sheet. Uh, I look at it. I'm like, I, I don't want to go up any. I'm going up dead last. I wrote my name dead last, you know. So I'm there at the bar. I'm hanging out. I'm watching it. As the show is going on, I'm getting more and more progressively nervous. My first time on stage, I don't know if these jokes are going to work or not. I have no idea. So... I had a few drinks, ended up getting pretty drunk, you know, I got really, really drunk actually to get up on that stage, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure I wasn't so drunk that I couldn't remember my material, so show's going on, I'm actually in the bathroom, because they had like single stall, you know, like, kind of like a unisex bathroom, you know, there's one, just a, basically it was like, it's like a fucking closet with a toilet in it, you know, so I'm in there, going over all my material, just going over the five minutes making sure i got everything down you know going over and over and over and eventually um jorge he had the, the blue lagoon comedy instagram message me like hey are you still here because you're up next and i flipped out like, oh fuck you know shit so like i ran out of the bath and ran up there to go check on it you know uh jorge was doing his thing um my friend brian snyder great comic he runs shows in santa cruz he was hosting that night and i was like you know it's his first time you want to introduce him as first time comic they're deciding what they're going to do i'm still like freaking out trying to still process my material in my head making sure i'm not fucking it up you know so they bring me on stage and uh i had a really i got lucky like straight up luck you know um i had a really really good set it was really good to the point where, like, after I was in the bar and people were like, hey, man, great set. It was your first time. That's good to hear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch out for you. I'm going to watch out. So I got to know these people, you know, talking to them a little bit. They're hyping me up. It's feeling great, you know. I'm excited. And then uh, I walk out of the bar and I see all the other comics who performed that night, like, kind of just, like, hanging out, standing together. And, like, I knew, like, all right, I'm not going to go over there and, like, try chiming in and bugging them and whatnot, you know? Like, I'm just a first-time performer. Like, I'm not going to go over there and be like, what's up? Like, I'm somebody or something, like, worthy of their respect or anything. Nah. I was just, I was already happy with myself for fucking making it there, doing a set. So, I'm going to get back to my car. It's an hour drive home. And I get in my car and I just, I yell, fuck yes, I did it. I did it. Like, yelled about how happy i was the entire way home because it was an amazing feeling like not only did i finally fucking do this and pursue it like i did well and i had something again you know like um prior to that i was taking you know clonopin to help me sleep like you know anti-anxiety meds and i would wake up and like my first thought would be about that life I was trying to build not being a possibility anymore. And uh, after I did stand up, I woke up and my first thought wasn't about that anymore. It wasn't about how my life was all fucked up. And 
what I was working for was non-existent, you know. It, I was still riding that high from the night before. I was still excited and happy. It wasn't something I was used to. <laughs> so I knew uh, after that I had to continue it. I had to keep going, you know. And I was really excited. Uh, shoot, what time are we at? About 20 minutes. Fuck, I've been talking for 20 minutes. And it feels like longer. All right, we'll keep going. So the next day I did comedy. Uh, I think that was Tuesday. I can't remember. If, I think I went to the Britannia Arms on Wednesday. Another mic. And um, I don't really remember how I did there. I don't remember it too well. The next like significant day that I did comedy was um, Monday. And I was at this place called The Swinging Door. You know? Like, I listened to Joey Diaz, right? Like the advice Joey De go blah, blah, blah. the advice Joey gave was like you gotta get there early. You know you gotta you know hang out with the other comics. You gotta say what's up. You know stay late. Help you know help out in any way possible. You know be a member of the community. Don't just be some like jerk off who goes there, does his set, takes off. You know, like there's comics who are trying to hit up multiple mics and everything. You know, but um, which I get, I do that too. But still, like go hang out, be a member of the community the time i was just doing one mic a night uh, at this point right now i'm hitting upwards two or three just you know really find my groove and uh get as much stage time as possible hash out my material yeah so next place i went to a swinging door it's one of the first people there i walk in i got the host name iman wrong i called him esme or something so i i don't remember what i fucking read and he was pitched what the fuck did you just call me and i'm like you know, he's grilling me, but I also know he's a comic, so I'm not taking it too harshly, you know? Like, I'm just rolling with it. And, um... So... I'm hanging out, um... I hear that this other guy there, his name's, uh... Alex. And Alex was wasn't really a he, well he is still isn't a comedian uh he'd been going to the open mic there at swinging door for uh for quite a bit you know maybe a year or two i forgot exactly the time frame right but when i got there i heard iman talking to him about like you know him doing muay thai and kickbox and stuff like that it's like okay dope like i can relate to this guy like i'll hang out with him you know say what's up you know maybe we'll be cool so you know i was hanging out with him I'm a good guy and uh when it came time to my set, I did my set. And at the time, my set was mostly just about what I was going through, just trying to, you know, just making jokes about, like, how I was feeling a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, and also really addressing it and trying to, like, sift through the bullshit of it as well. You know, that was my my earliest set. Like, um, I made a joke about, like, uh my ex-girlfriend being at the beach with um her her new boyfriend you know and then me being upset like that was our beach and just trying to have self-awareness and being like well, what the fuck do i own every beach like what she can't go to beaches no more because of me you know like that was kind of like the earliest material i had was really just trying to process uh what was going on with like my personal life and really owning up to, like, my own bullshit as well, you know? Like, I think that's some of the best comedy. That's why I really love Bill Burr. Because, you know, you recognize your shit and you own up to it. And if you make that funny, you know, it's really relatable and people love that. And that's one of my favorite forms of, like, you know, making jokes and doing comedy. But, so I went up there. I did my set. Um, when I got off stage, the host, Iman, you know, was like, you know, I... I uh, I relate, you know, same stuff happened to me. So, like, I'm kicking it off with him. He's giving me advice on, you know, the situation and everything from his perspective and what he went through. And he introduced me to another comic, uh, Xavier. And both, you know, talking to me, you know, they're tr helping me out and stuff like that, telling me, you know, their thoughts, what they did, what worked for them. And it was, it was really helpful. And not only that, but, um, it was really, like, the first time in my life because, um, I had been with my son's mom for about eight or nine years, you know, and uh, the truth was, like, all my other friends I had prior moved on, you know, like, I, I hung out with a couple of them, 
before, but they all started different lives and were different people. Now that, you know, I was at the time, what, 31, they're 31, 30s, they're not the same people they were when they were 20, you know? So they were cool enough to come hang out with me and say what's up, but it wasn't like I connected with them anymore. So to go from basically having nobody to finding this community of people who wanted to reach out and wanted to talk to me and hang out with me and give me advice, it, it's incredible, you know? And that's what I needed at the time. That's what I was looking for. So that was the third mic I did. And another reason why I stuck with this shit is because I found community, you know? Not only did I find an outlet and like, you know, some, you know, an art form basically to express myself. But I also found a community of people who wanted to help me, who wanted to be there for me and give me advice and, you know, see me succeed. I mean, at the time, you know, they were just wanting to help me with that breakup I was going through. But now, like, you know, um, a lot of the people at the blue I mentioned, like Simon who hosted, hosted the swinging door, you know, always, you know, excited for my success. And uh, that was something that, I was lacking in at the time, you know, like I have my family and whatnot, but an outside friend group to do that with, you know, gaining that was huge for me. And one of the main reasons I've been sticking with this, I mean, it's only been almost a year, but still, you know, should I put this over here so you can see me better on camera too? Maybe if I, uh, no, no, uh, fuck it, we'll leave it like that. But yeah, so that was Another, that was the third time I did stand up. Um, I really liked the Blue the most. At the time, the Blue Lagoon was an open mic. Now it's a featured only show. But you could sign up, or anyone could sign up. And from my experiences, still to this day, that was the open mic with the biggest crowd, the biggest audience. You know, like 30 to 40 people a night were in there watching an open mic. Uh, every other mic I've been to, it's mostly like five to maybe 20 people at most and they're all there not expecting to see comedy like they're fucking surprised so sometimes they turn around like there's comedy going on you know like they're unwilling unwilling participants in the, the show so i stuck it out with the blue i went there every tuesday i started getting more you know getting to know the people who are running it like um i took that advice from joey you know joey said like come early you know, so I would come early and I'd help set up. Uh, first, I would watch, you know, them take stuff down. Because at the Blue, we set up the chairs, the tables, everything, you know, for the comedy show. Because in that room, they do a whole bunch of stuff. They do, like, live music, uh, rap, poetry, all this all this stuff at the Blue. So, like, the comedy aspect had its own, like, special setup. So, we would get the chairs and the benches and everything and set all of that. So, like, when I'd stay till the end of the night, I'd watch all the uh, people who ran the show, you know, it's like a group of four or five comics. Uh, I'd watch them, you know, put all the chairs away and everything. So, i watched watch that, start helping out with that. When I showed up early, started, you know, um, helping set up. And uh, that, got, that got me noticed, you know. And also, um, one other thing I remember Joey saying was, like, don't ever feel entitled, you know. Don't be some jack-off going to a show and being... Like, like demanding spots or anything like that especially in the very beginning you know you're a nobody everybody there it's an open mic everybody's basically a nobody you know so the host be like can i put you up earlier yeah i don't care i'll be here you can put me up whenever you want can i put you up later after this person yeah i don't mind you know i'm just chilling what whatever works best for you and that that really got me um like some good feedback you know like people know that like oh he's cool like he you know, we put him up whenever. He's not going to complain. He comes early and helps us set up. Stays late, helps us take down, you know. And honestly, that's also my personality. Like, um, I don't really ever get upset about stuff that bad. Like, I'm really easygoing. So, it was easy to follow that, you know. And I'm glad I did because it... Just being that, like, cool person, I mean, I'm not saying, like, I'm so amazing, but, you know, just being laid back and, like, just going with the flow of the show and being, you know, helping out and just being like, yeah, you know, I'll do whatever you need, you know, whatever you want. That got me further, that really, 
like I, I've written good jokes and I'm, like I've been learning to write and be funnier you know and have the best stage presence but just being that type of person has got me further than any joke I've told you know like just being cool and hanging out and going you know make trying to make everybody's life easier that's what's really gotten me to take off and that's like the best advice I can give like sometimes people like other comics even will come to me like before starting out like how how do you get to where you are like dude I'm a nobody but you know I'm starting to build something you know slowly I'm on my on my track so that's how I did it I just um just do my best to be cool to everybody you know just make show up early hang out help set up stay late you know help take a part um just be a member of the community too yeah i don't i don't really know where to go with the rest of this podcast uh let's see here i'm about half hour in no let's do a full hour yeah let's do a full hour yeah i don't know what else to talk about um I think for a while I was doing pretty good as a, an open micer, basically. Like, you know, just being at the open mics and performing, you know. Like, um, I was doing between three or four sets a week. Uh, I would always do Swing and Door on Monday, Tuesday at the Blue, and I think it was Thursday at Britannia Arms. Yeah. That was kind of like my routine for the week. And, um... I was always looking for like more mics to do like more stage time you know i never want to be like a jerk off and be like hey can i get in on your you know your future show something like that you know especially that early in my career like i didn't want to be some asshole like pressuring or going to bookers and stuff like that like asking them especially that early like let me get on your show let me get on your show let me get on your show like i i felt like i wanted to earn it like i wanted them to be like hey you know i watch you perform i see you here all the time you're really funny why don't, why don't you come do a guest spot on my show you know that was my mentality as far as like you know the featured spots and the paid gigs so my first guest spot on a feat like a feature show only was um the brandon lounge like i was uh staying late at the blue lagoon one night you know taking shit apart stuff like that you know helping them uh clean up and uh jorge he i think he him and a few other people run the Brandon Lounge now, but at the time, it, um, it was solely him, you know? So I was, so he talked about, you know, show on Sunday. I assumed he, he was saying there's an open mic. So, like, I asked him, like, hey, you, there's a show on Sunday? And then he told me, yeah, come by, I'll give you a guest spot. And I was like, oh, oh, fuck. Like, I, I was asking because I thought it was just an open mic, you know? Like, I was just looking to, you know, fucking do five at, a, at any set, but... I had no idea it was a feature show, so that was like my first actual spot in a feature show, you know, it was unpaid, it was a guest spot, but it was still fucking time in front of an actual audience like that, you know what I mean? So, um, I was hanging out with a friend from high school prior to that, like, the show was on Sunday, we were hanging out Sunday, you know, afternoon, we went and grabbed a few beers, and then like that, that turned into like a whole day event, he decided him and his girlfriend were gonna oh well, i invited them and you know to come see me perform later on that was the first time i ever actually brought somebody i knew from like my my life to watch me do comedy so him and his girl came um we were drinking like all day and that was a mistake like i didn't actually like prepare my material plan it out really go over it i just went up there and thought i could do good because it was working out open mics i was fucking wrong that was like the first time i ever ate like a major dick all right like and not only that but it was at my first guest spot and it was in front of my friend and his girlfriend that you know my friend i've known since i was like 12 or some crazy shit so that that was rough you know and because it was a guest spot i went up very first and uh sat through the whole show whole show you know messed up like that <laughs> just uh taking that in taking that fucking l in yeah that that was rough but after the show you know like all the other established comics were all hanging out uh i think uh i mean 
you know, at the time, who was there hanging out after? It was um, this comic. He's been in the uh, Bay Area for a bit. I haven't seen him around a whole lot, but I always see him doing shows in, like, other areas. I think uh, Ed Black was a headliner, I believe. You know, uh, Jorge was there. He was hosting his show, The Branham. He had uh, Faco. He's a dope comedian, hella funny. Puts on shows in this area. And then we had Derek the Destroyer. We had those uh, local comics there. I hope nobody is minding me naming them. These are just my experiences. And I'm never going to say anything bad about anybody, you know. But um, we had those guys there. And we were all hanging out after the show. And then they knew... I was new, so it was dope. Like, I was sitting there with them, and they're giving me advice. They're giving me feedback. They're telling me what to do, you know, how to get better at this if I want to pursue this, you know. That they're telling me, do as many mics as possible. Got to get up there. You just got to be cool, you know. Stuff I was already doing, but I was just, you know, really taking it in from them, hearing it from, you know, the horse's mouth. You know, people have been doing this for a long time. And not only that, but they wanted to help me. Like, they were cool like that. And I was grateful. You know, so I took it all in. Like, I'd ask them questions, and they were, you know, answering it for me. It was fucking dope, you know? So, even though I had ate a dick at that open, or I ate a dick at that feature show doing the guest spot, like, um, I learned a lot, you know? Like, um, I learned a lot. I learned how to take in, you know, fucking up in front of uh, an audience like that, in front, in front of a friend. But I also learned a lot just about comedy in general from staying and hanging out with them, you know. Gave me a lot of advice on how to be better. Um, I think the next, like, big milestone was um, doing the San Francisco Comedy Day. So, there's a host, Caroline Hawkins. Uh, she hosts a blue from time to time, one of the people who would run, help run it, right? And, uh... You know, like, um, sometimes, like, uh, Jorge would message me, hey, if you get there early, you know, can you help Caroline set up and whatnot? I'm like, yeah, I'm down. Yeah, most definitely, you know? Like, um, I'm always, like, like I said, like, you know, down to help out. And, you know, they give me a free drink ticket, too, which is dope. It wasn't why I did it, but, you know, it was still a nice little kickback I get. So, um, Caroline knows how easygoing I was. And, like, I was always just, like, you know, there to help out, you know, there to go up whenever, you know, she she recently just had a kid, so I talked to her about being a parent, you know. So she was like, hey, you know, like, um, she messaged me one day saying, I think you'd be a good fit, you know, to come uh, do San Francisco Comedy Day with, you know, the rest of Santa Cruz comics. I was ecstatic, you know, um, talking to other comedians, you know, about it. And they're like, yeah, you know, this would be great. You can meet um, DNA is the one who runs it. DNA is like uh, one of the big comedy producers in the Santa Cruz area. Like, um, runs a lot of shows out there, but I, I haven't met him before. So I decided to do that, you know, like, like ecstatic, like really excited, like this big opportunity, you know? And, um, I get there and, uh, it's pretty cool. Like, you know, like hanging out with all the other people, all the other comics at San Francisco Comedy Day. We're in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. We're, uh... You know, setting up in the rain, like doing some team building exercises, pretty dope, you know? And one funny thing is, like, when all the other comics, like, in the Bay Area, like, who got the backstage passes, like, started showing up. Like, I got the backstage pass solely because I was there setting up. You know, I was just one of the homies, basically. I, I was basically like a, what was it, like a groupie, you know? Basically just a road worker. I forgot the term, but that's all I was. Uh, all the other local comics who never met me before didn't know that they assumed I was like someone I don't know from LA or something. I don't know. They're all coming up to me shaking their hand Introducing themselves to me telling me, you know, their accomplishments who they were stuff like that. And I'm just like, well, I'm Polly. Um I'm an open micer and I perform in Santa Cruz sometimes, you know <laughs> But um we all met in Santa Cruz, right? And uh, they told us, oh, we all meet up here and we park at this, uh, in front of this place called The Poet. And I never went there before, but I guess The Poet before uh, COVID was like a, a place where like, you know, they 
I mean, poetry and whatnot, but they had the comedy night there, you know, and people would do open mics there, go perform, and yeah, it was like a place, a place like that. Uh, I never got to experience it, though. Like, I started too late. So we meet up in that place's parking lot. It's also shared, like, it was the Poet's parking lot and the Bagel Shop's parking lot. And um, I guess with the Poet being shut down, it just belonged to the Bagel Shop at that point. So I am uh, I get there. I get there early because, you know, I want you know, make sure I'm on time and everything like that. I don't want to, you know, be late and have all these people I'm meeting for the first time wait for me. So I showed up like 15, 20 minutes early. I get out of my car looking to see if there's anybody I know. Um, as I get out, I think it's like five in the morning, maybe a little bit earlier. Some guy's walking his dog and he's like, hey, you going to park here long? And I'm like, no, I'm meeting up with some friends. And he's like, all right, just a warning though. Um, the owner, he tells everybody. So... The other people show up. A lot of them I'm meeting for the first time, right? Um, and I asked them, I was like, hey, uh, some some pedestrian walking his dog just told me that the owner here tows everybody. Is that true? And they go, no, we're fine. We, we park here every year for San Francisco Comedy Day. It's all good, you know? So a couple of people left before I did. And on the way back, because we, you know, we took multiple cars there. A couple people left before me, and uh, they end up saying in the group chat, like, hey, everybody who parked at that place got their car towed. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, fuck, my car got towed. I knew it. That fucking guy was right. <laughs> uh, I guess, like, the bagel shop owner came, became kind of a Nazi with the parking lot, you know? Like, I guess before when the poet was there, it was kind of a cool place to, like, hang out and park your car. Not anymore. That bagel shop owner was a dick. Our cars were there not for 20 minutes before we fucking called the tow company. So, I live an hour outside Santa Cruz. I'm just like, oh, fuck. What am I going to do? How am I going to get home? You know, I don't have a car. Like, ugh. And um, DNA felt really bad for everyone who got their car towed. He was just like, all right, everyone, uh, shoot me your Venmos. I'll send you some money and, you know, help you get your guys' car out, you know? And I got pretty drunk off cheap wine over at the San Francisco Comedy Day. So I'm buzzing. I'm getting a ride back with some people I just met. Shout out to the Webbers for giving me a ride back to Santa Cruz. And uh, I'm I'm pretty drunk off that cheap wine. Like the room is spinning. And <laughs> the car is spinning. And um, like I message back like, hey, you know, uh, nobody Venmo me any money or anything like that. It's just next time you guys are booking shows, remember uh, I'm a single dad and I'm really funny. And uh, they everyone started shitting on me, but, you know, I got the message across. Uh, yeah, so had a couple other comics. Uh, shout out to Colin and Brian for letting me crash at their place. Because uh, when we called the tow, the tow company, they told us, t- told us, told us that... Um, like, it would be, I think it was like $300 if we picked it up in the morning. But if they made us, or if we had them open the gate, it would be like an extra 200 or something crazy. So, you know, obviously I want to get out in the morning and try to save as much money as possible. So Brian and Colin let me sleep at their place. It was fucking dope of them. You know, they didn't really know me that well, but they helped me out like that. It's really cool. So, yeah. Um... San, I think it was San, Santa Cruz Comedy Day it was the following month, you know, or in a couple weeks. Um, yeah, DNA hit me up and he was like, hey, if you know you come, you check tickets, you know, I'll give you some money. And it was, it was dope of him, you know, I really appreciated that because it was like also like time or an opportunity for me to go and, you know, hang out with other comics and see this show and help out and whatnot. And um, I did that. And it was amazing. You know, it was great. Um, what happened after? Like, uh, I was hanging out with the other comics. We went to the Blue Lagoon after, kind of had a little bit of an after party, you know. I was annihilated. Uh, over there at the Blue, they had this band. The band was called the Randy Savages, right? And it was basically just like they were all dressed up like Macho Man. Uh, they were looking fucking dope, you know. In between, they were doing like cover songs, but in between the songs, they were like doing like little Macho Man skits, you know. Oh yeah, brother. You know, like 
I can't do a good macho man. I need to practice that. But they had it fucking down, you know. So um, it was pretty dope watching them. Uh, they even got this guy running for city councilman. He was the former mayor of Santa Cruz, Justin Cummins. He went in there, fucking dressed as Macho Man, wrestled one of the band members. I was like, hey, man, I don't fucking live around here, but if I did, you get my vote, you know? So that was fucking cool. But, um, you know, I'm drunk. Uh, I'm in there, you know, in the mosh pit. I'm 32. Everyone in the mosh pit's, you know, way younger. I shouldn't fucking be there. And then in between the songs, the lead singer goes, all right, who in the audience wants to hear another song? And who wants to see a fight? Now I'm blasted, so I'm just, you know, drunk yelling, fight, 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 you know, trying to get a chant going. And I did, you know. So the lead singer goes, all right, you. And he points at me. He goes, and you. And he points at this other dude. You two fight. And I'm all fucked up. So I look at him, like, and this guy looks at me. We're both a little, like, and then we both just kind of shrugged and we squared up with each other. And then the lead singer, he started panicking. He's like, no, 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 don't don't actually do that. Don't actually fight. No. And then then he just, like, threw us a Paps Blue Ribbon or some bullshit. I forgot exactly what. I mean, it was still a fucking dope-ass situation story. But, you know. We were about ready. I was, about, I was thinking to myself, I'm, I'm ready to fight for you, Macho Man. I know you ain't the real Macho Man, but I'm pretty drunk right now, and I'll fight for you. I don't, I don't give a fuck. You want me to fight this guy, Randy Savage? I'll fucking do it. <laughs> but, um... What does that take me to? That takes me about... I was, uh... Beginning of October. And then, uh... You know, still grinding mics after that. Hanging out. Um... Get to about... Yeah, Halloween weekend. Um... I get my first ever, like, legit paid gig. You know? DNA told me to come do a greater purpose with the rest of Santa Cruz comics. I went out there, dressed as Thor, uh, did my little my little set, and uh, got my first ever like legit paycheck in comedy. You know, I wasn't a paycheck; it was a Venmo, but still, you know what I mean. I got fucking actually made some money doing comedy for the first time. Prior to that, um, this was. Before Santa Cruz Comedy Day, uh, DNA let me do a guest spot at his, you know, show on Greater Purpose, and um, that was the first time I ever like experienced extreme imposter syndrome, you know. So I get there, and I think I'm the first one up, you know, which isn't a big deal. I don't mind. I know I'm the new guy, but you know, I get there. I'm sitting down. I talk. We're in a little like a uh, comics only area, you know, our green room. I'm talking to uh, the headliner's girlfriend, and she's telling me, like, yeah, you know, I performed at the Improv, I performed at the Laugh Factory, you know, tell me all these, like, crazy places that she performed at. I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, at this point in time, the biggest place I've performed at is right here. Like, I know, well, I'm about to perform here. Like, I don't have any credits to my name, you know? So I go up, I do my set, kind of, luckily that didn't really mess with me a whole lot. It wasn't until after... When her boyfriend went up and, you know, they're introducing him, you know. He has a special. He's been on Conan. Blah, 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 blah. I'm like, oh, fuck. You know? I'm like, jeez. So, they get off. You know, the show's ending. I'm talking to him. And I'm like, hey, you know, you guys did really good tonight. That was, like, super dope. Blah, 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 blah. And I even made a joke. I was like, hey, you know, performing with you guys has really ramped up my imposter syndrome. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I should belong here with you guys, you know? And they're laughing, they're having a good time, you know. And, uh, you know, laughing about, like, you know, me making that joke about the imposter syndrome and whatnot. You know, I'm like, no, 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 don't worry, that's all bullshit, right? Like, that, you know, it's all in your head. It was in that moment, um, this other comic who performed with us, she cut me off, like, stood at an angle, so I knew that she wasn't talking to me. And she invited, she was like, hey, does everyone want to go out and get tacos? You know, she invited the headliner, his girlfriend, his other comic, but she made sure to exclude me from the group. Like, while I'm standing right there, she made a point that, like, I'm inviting everybody but you. And this is just after I got off my little spiel about imposter syndrome, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I dealt with that. Um, it was whatever. Like, uh, 
No, it was one of my, I mean, I've experienced stuff like that before, but I was like one of the real first major times that I had like someone be like, kind of like big league me, talk down to me because of like my stature of uh, where I was as a comedian at the time, you know? And to be fair, like, uh, I haven't seen this chick around do anything since. <laughs> I don't know if she's still around in comedy or whatnot. Uh, she appears in, like, my recommendations on Instagram every now and then. But, I don't know. I saw her the next day at uh, Santa Cruz Comedy Day and I'm talking to her a little bit. She ended up being kind of cool then. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's all I gotta say about her. But... Yeah, from there, um, was getting, you know, little, sp still grinding mics, you know, Blue Lagoon every week at least, uh, other spots, trying to do the most I can, you know, try to get as much stage time as possible. But I'm getting more well known in the community and also working on my craft, you know. I don't know if you guys know this, but this is a storage closet I'm in. And, uh, it has no ventilation. It's getting fucking hot in here. Um, I'm wearing this shirt. One of my favorite shirts. It says, if I don't turn it into a joke, it will destroy me. And it's got Grover from Sesame Street. Shout out to fucking Grover. He's like the coolest fucking Muppet living on that street. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yeah, so... My initial goal was, um... I wanted at least I wanted to see if I could get one paid spot by the end of like the year when I was doing comedy. I mean, I'm still working on my way to one full year. June will be my first like full year doing comedy. But if by the end of like that, you know, 2022, I was like, all right, like if I can actually get a paid spot, then maybe this will be something I want to pursue even harder and give my full attention to. Because at the time already, like um. I had dropped out of school. Like I dropped out of the physical therapist assistant program. Um, the uh, depression I was dealing with, I just, I knew I wouldn't be able to do medical classes, you know? Um, so I was just working on being a uh, full-time manager at Trader Joe's, my other, you know, my job. And I was like, all right, if I get paid, then, um, I'll pursue this, you know, I'll pr pursue stand-up if I actually make this goal. If I don't, then I'll just solely focus on Trader Joe's as my main priority and kind of do stand-up on the side, you know? That, that was my thought process. That's what I wanted to do. So, I, yeah, like I was saying, I got my first paid spot, you know, uh, Halloween weekend. And that's that was a game-changer. That's when I decided, okay... I'm going to do this. I'm thinking about doing this, but I'll wait till the end of the year. So I kept getting more and more good spots, um, you know, some paid spots here and there. But what really solidified it was the December open mic improv, right? Or December open mic at the San Jose improv. Now I'd taken the picture of me in front of the improv one day back in like August, right? And, uh, sent it to my friend. I was like, hey, I'm going to perform here one day. And it's still, like, I still haven't, like, really performed, performed. I've gone up on the fucking open mic, you know? People who've gone up before me have told me it's their very first time ever doing stand-up, and they're up there, you know? But, um... I... Knew I had four minutes. That's how long you used to get at the improv, four minutes. So I practiced, like... Or I got all my material down, and I went and, like, found the best four minutes I could. Like, I cut all the fat off the bits and just did everything I could like had a solid four minutes right but I didn't know if I was going to get picked or not I had no idea um my friend at the time Tut he's still around you know he's a great comic doing things he told me meet him there at like the sign up started at like seven he told me meet me there at like 6 30 like dope so I got there probably at like 6 20 I realized I'm the first person standing in line there's nobody else here you know so I'm standing there, I'm waiting, I'm like, mm, okay, all right. Uh, the booker, I forgot his name, he's a British guy with glasses. Like, he noticed me standing out there, he saw my, like, my sweater, it said Sega and everything. He's like, oh, dope sweater, you a comic? I'm like, yeah, you know, and introduced myself a little bit to him. 
didn't, didn't know who he was, but, you know, just being cool and talking to him. And I think, you know, there's a lot of um, controversy about how they pick, pe- pick comics at the improv, stuff like that. Like, I'm there after that. You know, I showed how serious I like because I've gone up three times since three out of the four times I've gone to the open mic at the San Jose Improv. I gone up, but I'm there first. Like I'm the first person standing in line. Like I'm there to let them know to let them see me there and, you know, give that impression like, hey, I'm here taking this seriously. Okay, like I want this. This is what I want. I want to go up. I want to kill. You know, I'm taking this seriously and I want you to recognize that. And. Because I've gone up three times, I think they have. Like, I think that has set an impression. I don't know for sure, you know, but that's the only way I can explain it. Because there's... The way the sounds like improv open mic works is about 70, sometimes even more comedians show up. Somewhere between 25 to 35 actually get to go up, you know. Um, And we're all... All the local comedians are there. It doesn't matter if you're, like... A local headliner, if you're an open micer, still first time, doesn't matter. We're all sitting in the same room waiting. Like, I'm, I was sitting next to people I know who have, like, headline, you know, shows I've been on or stuff like that, you know, who have Amazon specials already. So it was pretty intense, you know, we're all there fighting for the same thing. And they called my name and uh, I was scared shitless. There's been many times, like, I've gone up and just, like, had almost near panic attacks. Uh, the first time I ever did stand up at Blue Lagoon, I was, like, super drunk. And when I was in their little uh, waiting area, it's a, we call it the green room. It's this, this hallway next to this open door with urinals. Like, I was hyperventilating. Like, I was panicking, you know? Like, I hadn't experienced, I hadn't done that in a while. I was doing it almost at every mic, and I had stopped. But this one of the sounds like improv, I was just like squatting in place. I was I was nervous. I was scared. And the two comics before me both got played off. Because at the improv, they give you four minutes. But if you start bombing, if you start doing a little bit bad, they'll play you off. You'll just hear music and that's your cue to get the fuck off stage. You failed your attempt. So not only can this like, you know, maybe go a little bit like there's no little bit bad it's either you do good or you do really bad you know so i was i was nervous as fuck i luckily i went up there and i killed it i had probably the best set of my life you know like it was a set so really fucking amazing like i was ecstatic like i got really really good laughs and such great audience uh feedback you know like it was amazing and the uh the booker actually came out after my set you know and he shook my hand and like he you know was like it was really good good i was impressed like, how long have you been doing this and at the time i think it was only five six months and i told him he's like oh he got a little disappointed I was like oh fuck and i've talked to other people about this before and they're like hey yeah you should have just lied to him <laughs> but um yeah he told me you did a really amazing job tonight just keep grinding mics and come back so um i walked back to my car I came alone that, that night. On my way back to my car, I was just fucking celebrating the street. I was actually recording a TikTok of me celebrating. And I was just so ecstatic and just like yelling and shouting. And just, Fuck yeah, I did it. I did it. And like, um, I even like accidentally walked in the street and a car almost hit me and honked at me. And I just ignored him. I was just like, Fuck that. I don't care. I'm just so happy. And uh, that's when I decided to really full on like just abandon like trying to try anything else really like i was like this is what i want to do that's what i'm dead set on like i want to get you know actually perform at the improv for a paid spot and not just the imp- like the improv like the main place you know i'm a san jose native that's like the san jose stage that's where i want to be but you know it was after that that i decided like i don't want to do trader joe's as full time as like my main like focus on that as my career path, you know, I was like, so I told my manager, the store manager, like, yeah, I had a really good set. The sounds like improv. This is what I want to pursue. And I talked to my other store managers or, you know, my department manager as well about, you know, my thoughts and what I had going on. And she's like, well, what's your passion? You know, are you passionate about this place? You know, and the, uh, the grocery store, the, 
basically the environment that Trader Joe's sets up. Trader Joe's is a really dope place to work. They let us drink wine in the back, you know. That was cool. But she was telling me, like, you know, what's what do you really want to do? You want to do this or you want to do that? And after that San Jose improv uh, set I had, I was like, I want to do this. I don't want to do anything else, you know. And um, it's been, you know, I've been progressively doing more stuff. That was basically what took me the first six months. Uh, at the end of December, I got lucky. I um, I got to host the Blue Lagoon, you know, the place where I started doing comedy. I got to host it that night. So I got to go up, open the, open up, you know, the show, introduce all the comics, everything like that. And it was amazing. Like December was one of the best months I had for doing comedy. I got to do that. Killed it at the improv. I think I had a, a paid gig or two. Like it was great. Um, yeah, that was like the first six months. And this has been, I mean, I'll, I'll get to the next couple months pretty soon. Probably maybe the next podcast. I guess I got up to an hour. Fuck, I've been talking for a while. Um, but yeah, like, uh, this has been a really big journey for me, you know? Like, it's been a lot about, like, self-discovery and growth and really figuring myself out and getting outside my comfort zone. Like, um, I'm naturally really introverted. Like, I used to never go out at all. Like, um, me and my son and mom, we just chill. You know, we go to movies or dinner or stuff like that. But, like, never out in, like, huge social settings like that. I've gone out more in the last, well, am I at 11 months than I did the first, like, 30 years of my life, you know? <laughs> and that's no lie. Uh, I've had my car since 2010. And before I started doing comedy, I think I had like 75, 80,000 miles on it. And now I have like 110. Like, yeah. Um, it really changed me as a person. Like, really understood who I was going out, you know, going, going outside my comfort zone, um, socializing more. Like, I had a lot of social anxiety, like being an introvert. And that's crazy to think, like, you know, having social anxiety, being introverted. And going on a stage and doing stand-up and trying to make people laugh, you know? Because I had fought before. Like, I used to go on stage and, you know, did my MMA. That's different. Like, you can lose. You can get hit, you know? Like, uh, I've had people, like, you know, chant or, you know, celebrate when the other guy beat me. But, like, it's nothing compared to going up on stage and putting a piece of you out there that you know and performing a joke that you wrote really like putting yourself out there and the audience just is not re- not receptive to it at all it hurts way more and it's way different you know than actually getting hit in the face it's, it's a way different feeling it's a way worse feeling so doing this you know i uh i learned a lot about myself um i did a lot of self-growth a lot of self-discovery uh and really, like, the thing I'm most grateful for is just, like, all these people who came to my life and really helped me out of a low point, you know? I met so many amazing people, so many different characters, you know, variety of people, hearing and getting to hear, like, their perspective and their stories and stuff like that. It's been great, you know? And I'm excited for what comes. I'm excited for uh, this journey and where it takes me. All right, I think that's the end of the podcast. Uh, this is about an hour-long podcast so far. Um, shout out to my sponsors, Nobody. Uh, I got this little Steam Stream Deck. This is what I've been doing to uh, change the the camera and whatnot. But yeah, thank you everybody. This was my very first episode. Uh, I hope it went well. I think the next episode I'm gonna talk about like some. Some of the crazy comedy things I went through in the last year. Like some fun stories I had. Maybe even do an interview or something. I don't know. I got some some cool shit planned. Alright. Thank you everybody for sitting through the first episode of Four, Four Hours of Sleep with Paul Escobedo. Oh, did I even... Hold on. I didn't even talk about why I named it Four Hours of Sleep with me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, working full time. So, I, you know, trying to do comedy full time. Like putting as much mic work as I can. This is where the name of the podcast is coming from. You know, I'm uh, putting as much work as I can doing comedy. Um, you know, I have my son, you know, multiple days out of the week. And I'm, I also work full time at Trader Joe's. I start at like five in the morning. 
So um, probably three or four nights out of the week, I'll get home. It's like 11. I got 11.30. I got to be up for work by like 4.30, 4.40 the latest if I sprint to get ready, you know. So I routinely get four hours of sleep. And it's actually becoming a problem. Like it's something I got to work on and fix. But uh, yeah, just uh, trying to grind and fucking hustle as much as possible. And that's where this the name of the podcast comes from, everybody. All right, appreciate y'all. Much love. Take care, everybody.